that consumer brand awareness that DeepL has is now also transitioning into an enterprise use. Language pairs involving English are better for the environment than ones that don't. So first of all, you could see them, you could hear them properly because of the mask and the microphone being meters away from them. And then in the middle of the meeting, they started shifting tables for some reason. And welcome to Slitterpod 89. Hello from Zurich. Hey, Florian, how are you? I'm okay. How are you? Not bad, not bad. Not bad. So you had a visitor last week. I did, yeah. I had uh, our lovely colleague, Anna, uh, visiting London. And so we managed to share a co-working space together for a few days, which was very good. In-person working. Imagine that. Yeah. You know, this is great. No, it's good to... It was have... a bit of a shock to the system, I have to be honest. Like going, back, going back to a kind of proper office space was like a lot going on. At the, lot... at the co-working, we work. Yeah. It's like there were dogs, you know, it's like coffee machines. It was all, it was all happening. <laughs> Things are happening around and you have to focus, but the colleagues yeah. there, so that's good. Yeah. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll go back to some form of, uh, some form of that work at some point. Um, but first today we'll be talking to Anya Peschel, CEO of Peschel Communications, and it's going to be all about interpreting RSI, VRI, uh, you know, in-person, booth, no booth, et cetera. So looking forward to that with Anya. And now today we'll talk about uh, can a deep bell as an add-on carbon emitting machine translation uh, figure that. A uh, couple of uh, on the record comments we got from Keywords new CEO. Uh, quick update on TransPerfect and my thoughts on the progress of automatic text generators, which I keep playing around with. So today, um, just first to, to get started. I went to a startup event yesterday, a startup pitch event, and they had a company pitch called Kaplina. Uh, imagine that. That was, an in, that was a first for me too. That was an in-person, probably about 150 people in a room event. Mm. And wow. uh, yeah, so no masks and, you know, things are going back. That's good. I did have to show that weird QR code certificate, which I could go on a political rant about now, but I won't because this is a language industry podcast and not. <laughs> not a COVID uh, thought um, podcast. Anyway, so I went to this event, 100, 150 people, uh, some good startups. And one of them was Kaplina, which is an NLP startup. Um, they're about three years old, a uh, spin off of uh, um, uh, Zurich's ETH, which is the, um, well, I actually don't know the proper name in English. So anyway, mm -hmm. ETH, one of uh, is what the best. Yeah, it's the best university in Switzerland. It's probably one of ah, the okay. top universities mm -hmm. in, in kind of continental Europe. Uh, so mm -hmm. technical um, technical university, lots of math, lots of physics, lots of, uh, you know, also NLP. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and so they're basically doing like customer feedback parsing. So, you know, if you're a big e-commerce company, you got tons of, or even like a, maybe a big telco or whatever, you have a ton of customer um, customer service feedback or customer feedback, yeah. you know, very kind of random text, chat protocol, stuff like that. So they'll help you parse through this. They also have a bunch of like market research uh, companies as clients, you know, the ones that would collect, um, mm. do kind of run market research projects. And then you, you end up with, you know, whatever, lots and lots of um, unstructured textual data. Like if you ask open-ended questions, right? So, so they help companies parse through this. They support 31 languages, I asked. Like, they didn't really dive into the language um, theme. They only had five minutes to pitch. So I was like, hey, so how many languages do you support? It was 31. Um, and, and then they said, but for anything beyond that, they can integrate with Google Translate and also DeepL. Uh, so okay. I went to their website, and it looks like the Google Translate integration is only for the quote-unquote freelance packages. Uh, for business and enterprise, you get the option to also add deep L. Now, what's my point? Because this is not an NLP show. My point is that we spoke about deep L in the past couple of uh, podcasts and kind of track their progress and their growth. Here you have a startup that could have gone with any kind of MT integration, right? Microsoft Translator, mm -hmm. Amazon, you know, obviously Google, uh, but they chose to go with DeepL and Google. And so DeepL is really becoming, in my view, kind of the standard here. I mean, this is a great way for them to get into, um, you know, other applications. This is, I mean, basically this startup is going to be a sales channel for them, right? So mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, so th this is my point. My point is, I mean, anybody could have done, I mean, th this, this is a wide open field and they could have chosen any kind of MT integration, but it shows DeepL. So it seems like that consumer- Do you think that's like home advantage though? It's sort of mm, German. Yeah, I mean, sure, world. if they were maybe in California, it might be DeepL and Amazon, but I mean, DeepL is really now in, in Europe. I mean, Europe's a big market, right? So mm. th my point is more kind of that consumer recognition, that consumer brand awareness that DeepL has is now also transitioning into uh, an enterprise use, right? Mm -hmm. So that's my point. And we'll move on from here, but it's an interesting, uh, 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 I hope it's an interesting observation. Let's go to a more esoteric topic, <laughs> if that's possible. Carbon okay. emissions for machine translation. And we picked up on a research yeah. paper a couple of days ago. So why don't you walk us through that? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, this was totally new for me. I had no idea that this was even kind of a sphere of research. Um, but yeah, there's apparently there's been sort of precursors to this work as well. So there's nothing... Super brand new, um, except that uh, researchers are now exploring the differences between language pairs, uh, machine translation language pairs, and their relative carbon emissions. So what does this mean? I mean, the basic idea is that, you know, training machine translations is pretty, well, data heavy, we know, but then also takes a lot of computational power. Um, and then the authors are saying, okay, it's really imperative that we look into this, try and make the process carbon efficient. So the process of training NLP models, but specifically language models and machine translation, which they say require a lot of computational power. And that leads to a large carbon footprint is their sort of premise for, for conducting this research. Um, they say the energy that is used to train machine translation engines is possibly contributing directly or indirectly to the effects of climate change. So hence them wanting to look at ways that potentially we can reduce or they can reduce making suggestions of proposing ways to reduce the carbon footprint of training machine translation engines. Well, hmm. as part of this experiment, uh, part of the research, they looked into six specific language pairs to see which ones were maybe more computational heavy, which ones were more, I think they called it carbon intensive to train. <laughs> tell us, tell so, us, Esther, yeah. which, which language combinations pollute the planet? <laughs> Don't keep me hugging. Yeah. That's, uh, well, drum roll. No, I was going to say drum roll. It's not that, it's not that big a drum roll. I don't think it warrants a drum roll, but. Um, so, they, well, they tested, hang on, let, I have to say this first, which ones they tested, because otherwise, you know, it's unfair to just single out a language as being carbon emitting. So they tested French, English and German and all combinations. So that's six different permutations of those. Um, and <laughs> they, they found, well, I mean, they had a lot of results, but I mean, the, the one thing that they really concluded um, was that Language pairs involving English are better for the environment than ones that don't. Um, and they did a lot of different tests and some of the languages performed slightly differently uh, in different tests. But there was this hypothesis that translation to German, so German as a target, whether it's from English or French, uh, might be more computationally involved <laughs> than translation into French or English. The most computationally expensive language pair of the one tested was French and German. French of to German. Of course. <laughs> there, there's so many ways, so many avenues we could take from here. So many side tangents we could uh, explore from here. So do you it, think, do you think our, it's also more computationally heavy for our brains to think in German? Yes. Yeah. Well, certainly for mine. Since I don't speak German, um, probably not for yours. I don't know. Yeah, maybe generally. Depending just... on well, depending on the uh, the setting, maybe maybe if it's a business event, you, it does require more brain power than uh, no. But just generally, English. thinking in German if mm. you're a native speaker is computationally heavier than <laughs> thinking in English if you're a so you're native working English harder. Speaker. We're just it's just too heavy. It, it was interesting though, and I, de I delved into this a, a fair amount and I was thinking, oh great, you know, for once we're not talking about blue scores or whatever, there's a new metric to look at something completely different. So we're not measuring quality per se, we're me measuring, you know, the effects of or the carbon emissions that come out of training this. 
uh, these machine translation engines, but they did actually bring in uh, blue, the blue scores a fair amount. So it was quite because they had to test during the course of training. Um, they also tested, okay, if we put the same amount of, um, well, if we do the same amount of training effectively, what blue score did the, did um, the language or the machine translation engine reach and how much power did it require to get there? And then they did a separate test, which said, okay, to bring up the engine to a blue threshold score of 25, which took the longest. So German target language pairs displayed both the lowest blue scores in the tests and also took the longest to achieve a blue threshold score of 25. There you go. Um, there you go. I mean, there's so many, there's, there, yeah, to me, there's a couple of steps to that, that take this too far. I mean, yes, it mm. takes, I mean, it uses energy, energy, obviously in the form of electricity, electricity needs to be produced and, uh, you know, the production of electricity contributes to, I mean, depending how you produce the electricity in some shape or form produces carbon, but I mean, kind of saying that MT possibly contributes directly to the effects of climate change. I mean, that is just yeah. to me, that's a step too far unless, I mean, there's enormous amounts of MT going on. But I mean, if you look at, I guess, the, I mean, what we'll be looking at here, we'll be DeepL, Google, Amazon's kind of uh, data centers, right? And how much, mm. uh, how much output or how much electricity they're consuming. So yeah, it's probably not the big, polluter but it's an interesting angle and i wonder if how would you explain that to your parents like hey i've spent the past three to four months researching this just imagine say hey, hey john what are you doing well i'm researching how machine translation impacts climate change like okay say more uh mm -hmm. yeah it's hard sorry it's hard for me to not get off on uh, you know uh, kind of go off on tangents here so um yeah uh, but well, I suppose there it's better are. than the opposite, which is not looking into it and being kind of blind to the effects of, you know, something which we're saying is now so fundamental to the industry. But it, just the sheer amount of computation, I mean, it would have to be enormous. I mean, there's all these uh, yeah. other stuff that's going on that must be computationally more intensive than than the machine translation. I mean, we spoke more, a lot about these avatars. I mean, just computing, mm. kind of rendering that. But anyway, I don't know. I'm talking out of school here. So, um, interesting. Check it out. German, more uh, the the bigger polluter here. Um, so moving on, we spoke briefly last week about uh, Bertrand Botts and the new CEO of Keywords. But he did uh, actually respond to our email and and added a couple of um, comments on the record. So um, t tell us more about that. Yeah, well, it was it was good to um, have his comments actually. Um, so yeah, good that he's uh, engaging with us. Um, and keywords. I mean, as we know, game massive sort of game localization and game development, game outsourced uh, provider um, has a new CEO who's actually stepping into the role in December. He said hmm. to us, uh, "Yes, yeah, so it's a few months to kind of prepare for the role, I suppose." Um, but he was saying keywords like playing video games. Playing video games, maybe, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, that would be good prep work or arguably, you know, <laughs> Sit at home, what might be seen as idle games. time for other people. It could be considered research for his new role. Um, but interestingly, I think we mentioned this last week. So he comes from Novartis. His current role is at Novartis, the life sciences farm giant. Um, so obviously we were kind of interested to know why he made the move or why he's making that move into gaming. Um, and he said, Keywords presented such an interesting opportunity to someone with my background. Um, he said he's been able to drive growth strategies in the past in sort of businesses of scale. And Keywords is already a proven market leader, which is true um, in the gaming space. Um, and that it supplies most of the major developers um, and in a sector that also has massive growth potential. So I think that's quite attractive to him. Um, he also mentioned um, potential partners and acquisition targets, um, saying that the, the platform that Keywords had uh, has built, sorry, is attractive both to potential partners and also to acquisition targets. Keywords has done a lot of acquisitions um, over, well, past several many years. Um, and he said, Keywords, I believe, can operate equally effectively across many adjacent content industries. Hmm. So potentially uh, looking to expand sort of outside 
of or adjacent to uh, gaming content? Well, that will be media. To me, that's a subtle hint at media, but potentially also other acquisitions, right? And they have the capital to buy. I mean, if they're interested in the localization space, then you know they mm. could they could go and acquire, uh, do quite quite large yeah. transactions. So. I suppose also outside of localization, they do things like marketing and, and game development. So there's opportunities to expand further into, you know, marketing and also development of, of other types of media. But I have one request. Please don't expand into other types of media and other services. Please continue to buy stuff in the localization space, because if you keep buying other things, we kind of slowly have to phase out our coverage of keywords because it's just... <laughs> I mean, if 90% of their business is no longer even remotely connected to the localization industry, what are we going to talk about? So please. Yeah, I suppose they, they will still remain the leading player in game localization, whether, you know, for, for the foreseeable, whether or not they, whether or not they acquire another industry. Yeah, but then just the results yeah. become kind of meaningless. I mean, if 90% comes from whatever other support marketing services, sure. operational But they do things. break it out. I mean, they break out their reviews, which is one thing that's quite helpful that other people don't necessarily do. So we can isolate the, the localization component fairly easily. Okay. Still, Bertrand. Still. Localization. It's the future. Please buy in localization. Um, one company that continues to buy is, or continues to buy, is, is stepping up. The buying is Transperfect. Uh, they hired Edgar Vargas Castaneda sharing uh, his surname with uh, one of Slater's uh, most uh, longest serving veteran, uh, Gerard Castaneda. Anyway, quick side note. So he joined them as TransPerfect VP of Growth Strategies from EY Parthenon, uh, which is the strategy consulting arm of Ernst & Young. He was a senior director advising on acquisition. So that's that's a pretty... That's a pretty strong signal. I mean, if you hire a VP level kind of corporate development person that's, you know, fully looking at doing m and I mean, so we, we'd assume that Semantics wasn't the last major acquisition. And, you know, with the, they re recently did that refinancing we spoke about. So I would expect TransPerfect to do a fair amount of um, M&A going forward and, you know, Let's see how fast it can integrate or not semantics. And, you know, maybe the appetite is for, for even larger deals. So mm -hmm. kind of moving away from their historic um, bolt-on small acquisition strategy. Um, and interestingly, we learned about this probably from a press release, but it was also from a, a Mesa post, uh, the mm -hmm. media and entertainment. Um, and, uh, you know, we had Chris Fettner on the podcast when they just launched. So that's a different one. That's EGA. Oh, that's EGA. Sorry. Mesa yes. is Media and Entertainment Services You're right. Alliance. Good yes. point. Good point. Yes, it's another one. Uh, but it's a media, it's a media outlet, media local outlet. So yeah, thanks for correcting that. Um, yeah, who knows? Maybe, maybe more in media competing with keywords, full circle. They also just briefly, they they continue to battle in the courts with like one of the leading law firms, uh, the hmm. Skadden Arps. Uh, I can't really go into the details here. Go and read the press release that they put out. I think there's some battle around, um, you know, they, they, they had this, this whole ownership fight three, four years ago and TransPerfect continues to, um, to litigate with, with some of the lawyers that were involved in that deal, especially the, 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 cust the custodian. So the person that actually oversaw TransPerfect on behalf of the courts when they were uh, in that forced sales process. So, you know, there's, there's continuous litigation around this. So, you know, um, yeah, l l let me just... I'll let that stand there, go ahead and, and read the original source, but more m a still some litigation and uh, that's that. So uh, yeah, live translated captions in Google Meet. Mm -hmm. We did speak about it, but we can't test it. Why is that? <laughs> yeah, it's very upsetting. Um... It's upsetting. <laughs> I mean, there is a way around it, but I don't think we really want to upgrade to uh, whatever it is, Google Workspace Business Plus or any one of their other subscriptions so yes it's only available currently in beta and for a limited number of the packages um, including enterprise plus education plus etc uh, but not uh, to the subscription that Slater has so unfortunately we can't test but yeah if anyone out there can test and has uh, any experience of uh, google meet and using the beta live translated caption options please do let us know how it how it goes um, currently they say 
they can do English meetings, so English source, English speeches, speakers, translated into Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German live. So it does not facilitate two-way conversation between multilingual speakers. I suppose it's designed more for kind of a broadcast type announcement or one person speaking more in English where there might be participants who are not familiar with English. So just pause you there for a second. We did test this quite extensively for the video localization report, right? Not the Google yeah, one, not but the Go Skype not one. Google. Or... Skype. We tested Skype. Yes, and it we was did. In... Basically useless, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I mean we tested a number of languages. I mean, so the English English to English live captioning is pretty good ac across all of the ones that we tested. So that was Zoom and Google and Skype. Mm -hmm. Skype at that point was the only one that had um, live translated captions available. I think we tested in sort of three, four languages. I mean, uh, I did not do a full QC or I did not order a few a, a full quality control of, for example, the German or the Portuguese. Um, but I mean, I did read through the, the French and Spanish and I think you can tell that it's it's not it's not there. And that is that was tested with well, my I was speaking, so you know, native English, UK accent, um, one speaker trying to deliberately actually pause and speak clearly and slowly. So I kind of gave it every chance to hopefully <laughs> perform quite well. Um but obviously it's developing and other people are well, Google now is uh continuing to try to roll this out and no doubt it will get better. So yeah, I think it it's just very challenging with, I mean, the breaks, the mm. false starts. I'm sure there's some lingo for this, like that I'm, I'm butchering this, but like but you, you, you start a sentence, you pause, you kind of take another, mm. uh, yeah. you know, attempt at, at starting. I mean, ha that would put just what I said just now, exactly. completely throw like any, any MT off. Cause where would yeah. it start? And I was reading from a script. So that is easier than a for than a sentence that you're trying to formulate on the fly. Um, and I think that's that's where a lot of them will struggle. I think it's still a lot to do with the ASR rather than the machine translation. It's, you know, we were talking about Zoom at the time acquiring Kites, which is geared up for this comp uh, sorry conversational um, speech recognition. So conversational speech recognition would hopefully deal a bit better with the full starts, with the ums and the ahs and unfinished sentences as well. Yeah, let's talk to uh, Anya as well about how interpreters are doing this when they do, you know, simultaneous. So interesting yeah. question, uh, not a major, I guess. Game changer for now. <laughs> yeah, for now. And plus we can't check it out because we don't have the business plus. No, we can't. You know, I, I did I did review if it makes sense to upgrade, but the, the, the additional features you get are so arcane that, I mean, for now, it just doesn't make sense for us to upgrade. I'll um, roll it out at some point to the to the version we're using, I'm sure. Probably, yeah. Uh, also rolling out, hey, look at all those segues here. Also rolling out a new version is Copy AI. They uh, launched a new web app. Um, apparently their initial web app was just built on, on Webflow, which is kind of a no-code web, website tool. and um, yeah, integrated there. So now they have a kind of a native web app. Um, I relaunched the app, looks a lot cleaner. Um, but I still find, I just struggle to find like a real life use case mm. because the output is so random. I mean, I, I love the setup. It, so what is it? It's a text generator. You, 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 mm. you, you say, for example, you punch in event copy. Right. And then you have the header and I'm like, okay, a translation service and localization technology summit. And then you click write event copy. But the outcome, I mean, I don't know what I'm, I actually don't really know what I'm expecting. Um, but like, it's just random. It's not gibberish, but it's just like random. It says, for example, the outcome of this event copy, uh, translation summit will be that's automatically generated, right? It's a uh, quote, mm. like language barriers are stopping companies to enter the global market. For the first time ever, B Global is organizing the Global Business Summit where companies meet to learn about localization and translation tools, and more importantly, how to use these tools more efficiently. At this first global event, companies, blah, blah, blah. It's like, 
okay, but like, what am I going to do with this? I can't. Yeah, use and I it. think if you're a copywriter, you'd you take issue with quite a lot of it. Like, companies can meet with companies. It's <laughs> yeah, you're right. you know, it's not great marketing, uh, and not to mention the grammatical error in the very first sentence. Uh, uh, language barriers are stopping companies to enter. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's from that's entering. one. From entering, yeah. yeah, from entering, and companies can meet companies. I just don't know. I mean, I I keep paying the subscription. I keep playing around with it. I still don't know. Mm -hmm. So if anybody knows like an actual real life use case for like this type of uh, text generator, let me know beyond what we mm -hmm. discussed with Michelle from E2F at Slatercon, which is like generating a bunch of uh, reference data, right? Yeah. That That is one thing I see. Do you know I what's see. also random is the very last sentence I can see it here is it uses the ampersand for and. And everywhere else, it uses A and D for and. So I know what you mean about it being random. It's random because, it, well, it takes it, it's GPT-3, right? It's taking it, it's, it's, it's outputting what it learned, quote unquote, on the internet. Yeah, yeah. So it's just kind of regurgitating all of that. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't know. I don't actually know what I'm hoping to get, but it's, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. All right. Uh, let's head over to Anya. Talk about interpreting from A to Z. All right. And welcome back. Uh, now really happy to have Anja Peschel join us today. Anja is the Managing Director of Peschel Communications, a Germany-based LSP. Hi, Anja. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us today. So where does this podcast uh, find you today? What region, what city in Germany? Well, I'm actually not in a city at all. I'm in the countryside. I'm in the Black Forest uh, today at an altitude of 1,000 meters. And, uh, but normally I'm in Freiburg uh, in the southwest of Germany, which is quite close to the Swiss border. So not so far away that's from you, Florian. close to where I am. The Swiss not border. Not so far away. That's probably, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's the closest, uh, closest guest we've had for a while. So welcome from the Black Forest. So... Uh, so Anya, tell us a bit more about Peschel Communications, the company, but also, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're an active uh, interpreter. So just tell us a bit more about the company, the interpreting side, key services, and then maybe going back a little bit further, like what made you actually start in this industry? Right. Uh, well, my company, Peschel Communications, uh, is uh, what you'd call a boutique LSP, I suppose. Um, our client base is mostly Mittelstand, uh, so SMEs. And also a lot of public institutions like universities and such like. And um, we mainly focus on a few fields like law. Renewable energies is a big one for us uh, due to the location because Freiburg's very big on, on renewables. Um, medicine, marketing, and a lot of science and academia. And, um, well, we, we offer translations uh, in the in the uh, traditional sense, but also conference interpreting, organizing big teams, um, if uh, requested. We do a lot of transcreation work and also audiovisual uh, translation. And yeah, oh, wow. as you said, I'm a, I'm a conference interpreter myself. I have a degree in conference interpreting, and um, uh, I'm I'm active. So I wear two hats in a way. I am the managing director of my company but I'm also a freelance interpreter. That, that's interesting. Tell, so uh, before we went on the podcast, you mentioned that sometimes you're like, when you go to um, uh, an interpreting gig for your company, how does that work? Like you're, you're one of many or like just walk us through that, like a, a typical interpreting gig. Yeah, that's, that's basically it. So if, if we have um, a bigger conference to um, supply interpreters for, we, um, we maybe have a team of, of five for five languages and um, and I'm just then one one of the interpreters hired by my company. And they're not nervous that the, the boss is uh, is watching? I don't think so. Sitting in? <laughs> no. I'm All usually right. pretty nice. <laughs> it's it's an interesting dynamic, I think. But um yeah, let's maybe focus a bit more on the some of the differences between interpreting and translation since you're offering both. What do you think are the key differences in running, you know, the written translation services business versus the interpreting services business? I think that the main difference is actually that uh, interpreting is less anonymous. When clients 
want to book interpreters, they usually or very often they have specific people in mind. They want to book me or a specific colleague and they may ask for a name. And that doesn't happen very often with written translations. It might do, but not that often. And um, also because uh, as conference interpreters, we work with teams. I actually get a lot of my assignments through my colleagues because they just need a partner to to go to a job. And um, so you can't send mass emails out to try and recruit interpreters and hope that someone really qualified will answer and, and accept the job. But it's, it's a much more personal business, I think, than a, uh, translating. And that's really it's actually also, it's a good, uh, good, yeah, go on, please. Um, yeah. So, um, well, also I, what I noticed is that there's very little overlap actually between our translation clients and our interpreting clients for some reason. So t- totally different market, different client or different client set. Mostly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean. It, it's super interesting those those two dynamics that you've that you've identified the kind of personal aspect and then the sort of different client base. I mean, are there are there similarities? I mean, there must be a reason that you know companies offer both translation and interpreting. What key things do you think the two services have have in yeah. common from a business perspective? Well, I mean, obviously they're both language services and very high highly skilled services. And um, I think the other thing that they really have in common is that they require a lot of explanation. Most clients don't really know what it is that they really need or what their expectations are. And you have to take the time to talk to them to really find out what's, what it is that they need. Like with written translations, most clients don't know whether they want transcreation or translation or anything in between. You have to find out by talking to them and, and seeing what they want to do with the product. And the same goes for interpreting. Uh, clients might uh, call in and say, I need an interpreter for a conference. And then I have to start by explaining that we work in teams, that um, maybe with simultaneous interpreting, you have to um, have a team of two or three people per language combination. And uh, maybe they need consecutive interpreting. Maybe it's better suited for their purpose. And all of that takes quite a lot of time and patience because that if people have never had any contact with our profession, they just don't know. A lot of them don't even know the difference actually between translation and interpreting, to be honest. And um, yeah, there's actually wow. one one <laughs> other thing that I think um, the two have in common, and that's as an agency, we need a really, a really good relationship with our suppliers. Uh, we need to um, look after them to... Ha- stay in contact with them to respect their professionalism. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting, again, that, that what you're identifying is some of the similarities there. Um, I mean, it, it's always interesting to me, the businesses that are, that are doing both translation and interpreting and, and doing it successfully as well, and, and some of the, those differences um, that exist within the two markets. Um, I mean, you might not be aware of this, but earlier on in in the segment that Flora and I do together, we were talking about Google tran- Google's uh, new translated caption feature. So it's a live translated caption feature that they're currently doing in beta. Um, and we were talking a little bit about how it's likely to struggle with dealing with live speech. Um, so, I mean, from from someone or from someone who has a you know professional experience of working as an interpreter, and from from your own sort of observations as well, how how do you think um, that professionals interpreters are dealing with the things that some of the technology might struggle with? So, I think things like you know discontinued sentences or the ums ahs starting and stopping. How do you interpreters handle that when they're interpreting live? Well, it has a lot to do with um, the what we call decalage, which is the distance that we have from the speaker. So if a speaker has a lot of ums and ahs or speaks very slowly, then we will actually try and hold back a little bit and let the speaker say a bit more before we start. And that way we, in a way, summarize the sentence or we leave out all the redundancies and um, the other thing is that um, we uh, don't necessarily stick to the words 
in, in the way that you might think, or certainly in the way that a captioning software will stick to the words. I think that very often as interpreters, we actually say what a speaker wants to say, even if the speaker never actually said it. So there's a lot of reading between lines that um, I think the technology will always be struggling with. I just, I love this. This is such a philosophical topic in a sense, like, I mean, for, for the technology to ever get there, it has to be, you know, literally like Terminator self-aware kind of fully generalized AI, because yes, you're, you're, there's so much empathy and, and obviously language knowledge and, and subject matter expertise that goes into an interpreting session like that, you know, let alone the whole kind of processing two things at the same time, which always boggled my mind. I mean, I, I was, I'm a translator by training. And then I think I got into that kind of, uh, uh, early, hey, maybe you want to become an interpreter session. And I'm like, uh, you know, after a, a couple of days, I'm like, yeah, I don't think I'm made for this. Like my mind just started immediately wandering and like I lost, uh, I lost the train of thought immediately. So I really respect the craft here as well. Uh, and yeah, so I don't really see how this would work in practice uh, ever, almost ever, unless like you get some really highly aware AI at some point. So I don't want yeah, to I mean, have a like, conversational yeah. Yeah. talking about that, won't we? Yeah, yeah, things like jokes. I mean, that's always the question that we, well, that's the question that we get asked a lot. Well, how do you deal with jokes? How do you deal with a joke that's maybe not politically correct and you don't really want to translate it? AI would just go ahead, right? Mm -hmm. right? But as, a, as an interpreter, you have to make decisions like that, whether you actually want to tone something down or um, say it as it is or, or just leave something out or maybe just say the speaker just made a joke. Please laugh. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you adjust this by like, like interpreting settings? So like maybe sometimes like, okay, now I have to be extremely loyal to what the person says, even if it's a terrible joke or politically incorrect, but I really need to transmit that. Or, or is it like, do you have a kind of a more general approach to this? I think, I think it's just intuition. I don't really know how to answer that, but yeah, I mean, I know what setting I'm in. When I'm at a conference, I know who my audience is, and then I'll probably just take it from there. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, maybe, just an example. Maybe like a politician says something, you know, completely ridiculous. I mean, you can't. You kind of have to say that, I guess. Um. Anyway, so let's switch to uh, COVID. I mean, you know, for interpreters, that was uh, probably one of the biggest. Uh, I mean changes ever, I guess, in, in the profession's history so far. Um, so how did you experience kind of the early days and, you know, how have uh, things developed since then? Yeah. Um, well, when the first lockdown happened, um, obviously everyone was in shock, uh, including me. And, uh, and then we just spent quite a few weeks uh, talking to customers who wanted to get out of their contracts because their meetings had been cancelled. And... Um, at the time, it just seemed like we were doing damage control because nobody knew how long this whole situation was going to go on for, of course. And, uh, and then once all that had been done, suddenly things got very quiet, very quiet and really worryingly quiet. And um, we started looking into maybe alternative services and offered some of those as well, such as pre-recorded interpreting for pre-recorded videos so that uh, that could be supplied to customers instead of a conference. So that was okay, but it didn't fill the void that had been left by all the conferences being cancelled. And then clients started requesting remote interpreting more and more. Uh, first, at least in my case, it was more consecutive uh, interpreting. Uh, uh, which which took place via Zoom or, or something like that, and then um, more and more simultaneous. And um, I have to admit that I was very skeptical at the beginning, and I thought, oh, no, I'm not going to do that, and oh, I don't want to. And the first few meetings were, to be honest, a nightmare. Um, the sound was really bad. Connections just totally collapsed. Nobody knew what they were doing. Um, it really was a terrible situation. I had meetings where I just saw the tops of people's heads and, but not their, their faces. <laughs> um, there was another meeting where there were three people in a room wearing face masks. Their microphone was at the top of the ceiling on the ceiling somewhere, couldn't be muted. So first of all, you couldn't see them. You couldn't hear them properly because of the mask and the microphone being 
meters away from them. And then in the middle of the meeting, they started shifting tables for some reason. Uh, so uh, situations like that really, really made me wor- wonder whether I wanted to do this at all. But um, things did get better. I think like the learning curve was quite steep for most people and um, people started using headsets and muting themselves when they didn't want to be heard. Uh, they started using the camera so that the faces could actually be seen. So things got better. And one thing that was really noticeable is that um, the this, these kind of new possibilities also opened new opportunities for us as interpreters. Personally, I've been doing a lot of RSI meetings, remote simultaneous interpreting meetings that are just an hour or so, usually internal meetings, employee information meetings, something like that. And they suddenly it's occurred to people that they can be translated and therefore more people can be reached. So that's that's quite nice, <laughs> I suppose. Um, also, though, on the other hand, I know of quite a few colleagues who just decided this wasn't for them and that this wasn't the job that they originally signed up for and just left the industry. Hmm. Yeah, that was my a question I wanted to ask. Like, what's the mood like among interpreters? I mean, it's like kind of one and a half years in now and, you know, uh, you know, God knows when it fully opens up. I mean, here, I guess, I mean, I was at a conference this week, so that was good. A hundred people mm-hmm. in a room for the first time, but like slowly, slowly it's opening up. But, but what's yeah. the mood like? Um, well, I mean, it's been a roller coaster, obviously, um, but I think um, most of us are relatively positive now. I mean, I've had my first few in-person events, which is wonderful. And the first time I was in a proper booth again in the same room as the delegates with that, I was just ecstatic. I couldn't believe how good the sound was. <laughs> I couldn't remember how good sound the sound could be. Also, having my colleagues with me and being able to collaborate properly, being able to see what's going on in the room, all of that. So I think we all know how much we've missed this. And um, so I think most interpreters can't wait to get back into proper conferences. At the same time, I think we are a bit apprehensive because there's no telling whether all the jobs that were lost uh, as a result of the first lockdown, are going to come back. We just don't know. Hmm. We'll have to see. Um, so there are new opportunities, but there are jobs lost. We'll have to see, I suppose. And um, one thing that I'm personally really hoping for is more hybrid events, the kind of events where you have speakers and interpreters and maybe some of the audience in one location, but the the whole conference then gets streamed to an audience, which of course can be much larger then and much further afield. And uh, you could possibly add languages, for example, to, to reach a wider audience. And I think that's that's a really great opportunity for for the whole um, events industry. Yeah, I mean, you were mentioning there the the, mm-hmm. the learning curve associated or that you, even you went through um, and obviously that some of the participants of meetings are going through when they're first experiencing virtual meetings and, and remote simultaneous interpreting. But if you move past that kind of learning, initial challenge and learning curve, are there pros and cons that exist, you know, after you've overcome that initial hurdle of, of just getting familiar with, with the whole setting? Uh, what pros and cons do you identify with, with RSI? Well, I have to be honest that I didn't miss traveling all that much. I didn't miss sleeping in hotels and um, uh, having an ever larger CO2 footprint and uh, waiting on drafty train platforms for a delayed train and stuff like that. So I think the traveling stress is definitely not being there anymore. That's definitely a pro. Um, also, I think just the possibilities that have been opened up of staying in touch despite the pandemic, of staying in touch over larger distances, of having shorter meetings uh, to fill in a gap maybe between in-person meetings. Um, I think that kind of thing is a real opportunity and a real uh, advantage of of now having learned how to do RSI. And I've already mentioned, of course, the new opportunities and the new meetings. 
However, <laughs> there are quite a lot of cons to RSI. I think we have to distinguish a little bit whether we're talking about working from a hub, um, which is like an interpreting studio where interpreters go work together. So they're co-located, they have um, technical support or actually working from home. Um, working from home, of course, and, and the biggest problem is always the sound, in my opinion. Uh, these um, headsets like the one I'm using and, uh, well, so you're not using probably, but most most uh, conference participants now use, they have a noise cancelling technology, which is great at the moment, for example, because I've got a really annoying fly buzzing around here, so you can't hear that. But um, this noise cancelling technology actually takes away some of the frequency that we need um, to give us more information as interpreters. Um, and so we, what you get through that technology is a limited frequency. And if things get really bad, and this happened to me once, is that if the frequency that I hear um, through this is the same frequency as my own voice, I cannot hear the speaker anymore. This really happened to me once. I just couldn't hear the female speaker. She obviously had to say it was a very similar tone of voice to me. And um, uh, so I had to wait for her to finish and then quickly uh, deliver the translation. So that was not fun. Um, also, because of this, this lack of frequency, you have less, you hear less of the modulation. Uh, sometimes, of course, there are bits missing, as we all know, when the internet connection is bad. Uh, you have to do your brain has to fill in those bits, which is extra, extra, an extra load, of course, on on the mental mental load, or background noises when you have people sitting in their garages uh, with a big echo, or people phoning in from their cars, or whatever. Um, so I think that's still a problem because it's really difficult to explain to client that just because they feel that they can hear okay. This does not mean that the sound quality is sufficient for simultaneous interpreting. It's just really different. We just need so much better, so much better quality. Yeah, another another problem I think with with RSI is just the lack of control, um, especially working from home. Um, when I work from my office, I don't have very good windows, unfortunately, and so when there's an ambulance going past. Then uh, there's an ambulance you're going past, and everybody Germany can hear it. You, you don't. You're in Germany. You don't have good windows. Wasn't that uh, right. one of Merkel's kind of bombs where she said, "When I think of Germany, I think of like tight windows or something like that." I read that. Well, a week yeah. Ago. Compared to the UK, I can say we have quite good windows, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have double glazing, and my sound, no. <laughs> my insulation is okay, but I am on an extremely busy road, so I do still hear yeah. ambulances. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, talking about all. I was, I was going to uh, jump in and say, I mean, talking about some of these you know, current limitations, maybe in terms of audio, um, whether it's a hardware problem, whether it's a software problem. I mean, what, what do you think are some of the things that, well, you and other interpreters are, are really in need of? What features do you really want that you don't currently have for, whether from the platforms or in order to facilitate RSI? What are the must-haves that you think might be lacking at the moment? Um, you're talking about um, RSI platforms, dedicated platforms, or about the situation it, in general? Yeah, exactly. On, on both, I think both on the platforms. I mean, things that the platforms can help to facilitate, but I mean, also any sort of audio, maybe software, hardware that you're using in addition. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, the more hardware and software I have to use while I'm interpreting, the more distracting it gets. I mean, that's, that's just something that you have to keep in mind. And that's, in my opinion, also one of the problems with RSI platforms, because as an interpreter, I have to do most of it myself. So I would say at the top of the list for me is technical support. Somebody who will worry if the internet connection fails or if something else goes wrong so that I don't have that additional stress because my job of listening, translating and uh, delivering uh, something that people want to listen to is, is hard enough as it is. So I think that's, that's one of the, the big ones. The sound, of course, I've mentioned that 
has to be good. Also, things like synchronicity between uh, the the video and the sound. Often, in if you wear if you use Zoom or another platform, there's just this really slight delay, and it is really irritating when you're interpreting because your brain just notices that something confusing and has to work really hard to not notice that in a way. Um, Another thing that these platforms don't have, and that basically they, they just need to imitate a real life interpreting booth as, as well as possible. And that means being able to listen to both the floor and the booth partner at the same time. And um, also the handover function. You see, we take turns usually of about half an hour or so with RSI. It's more like 15 minutes because we're done after 15 minutes and need a break. And um, usually when we're in the booth, we just do that by hand signal. And um, so either we need to see each other or have some other way of making sure that we do a proper handover so that nothing gets lost. Yeah, in interesting you mentioned the delay. Uh, this is sometimes even a problem on this podcast. Like we have, maybe yeah. even on this one here, I mean, listeners yeah. tend to not notice, but there's usually like a one second slight delay. So when we talk over each other, we're, we're not rude here on the podcast. It's just because there's, there's a tiny delay. And it even for uh, just doing a podcast might be irritating a little bit. So uh, you, you mentioned the these kind of remote interpreting hubs, and I think uh, you have a, a partnership with one of those companies. So, so that... Uh, Tell us a bit more about that. So you go there and, and there's the setup, but basically you'd still dial in remote to a conference or what, what's that hybrid setting look like? Yeah, uh, actually, I, I really like working from hubs. Um, you don't have to wear a suit because nobody's going to see you <laughs> like when you go to a proper conference. So there are advantages to that too. And yeah, the setup is we have proper interpreting booths, um, just like you would see them as a conference, those boxes. And uh, we work together. We, all interpreters go to the hub and then we have sound engineers who deal with the rest and our clients can just dial in um, and use their video platform, their preferred platform. We have uh, clients who use Zoom, clients who use WebEx or or whatever. And um, and then they just, um, we just get the sound. It has to be said, it's almost as good as working as a, at a real conference because we have all the, we also have the um, hard console, which is quite important for us, where we can dial the volume up and down with a proper dial and not fiddle around with a mouse, uh, which is a lot more distracting. Um, but that being said, if um, the participants of the video conference don't use proper equipment or if the internet connection is bad, we still get mediocre sound and even the best Sound engineer can't do anything about that. I think with all of the the advances or maybe the uh, youth or the, of uh, RSI that's been happening over the past 18 months, do you think that client expectations and requirements have changed uh, as it pertains to interpreting? Yes, definitely. Um, well, I think we've seen it everywhere that standards have relaxed. You know, people don't mind if there's a cat walking across, <laughs> across a desk or um, a child walks in while people are in the meeting. That kind of thing has just become acceptable. And even I think people even like it in a way because uh, it shows that everyone's human. And the same has happened to us too. So if the ambulance drives past while I'm interpreting, my clients will forgive it because this is just the way that things work at the moment. So um, that's taken the pressure off a little bit, I'd say. And um, we'll have to see how that develops. I mean, I think it will develop in the same way as um, expectations uh, without interpreting in other meetings. And another change that I've noticed is that people just don't want to sign uh, contracts anymore until two days before the event. That makes planning really difficult for us. Although I understand why why people don't want to commit any sooner. Uh, they paid the price before when they had mm. to pay uh, fees without uh, actually needing the service. So clients want more flexibility, uh, a lot more flexibility, but they're also more flexible themselves, I think, in terms of uh, the conditions, I'd say. 
just go back just briefly to the kind of this technology element here. I mean, is is there any are there any kind of aids that you're using, like interactive glossaries or kind of dynamic things or tablets on the side, or like is it just purely like when you do RSI, like you're here, you see the speaker, and you're processing. There's no like other tools or aids or anything like that 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 help. Well. I use what I use in the booth in an on-site conference as well. I use uh, my laptop with glossaries and an internet connection, and but that's pretty much it. Uh, what we do oh. use, actually, in addition, I suppose, um, when we work via Zoom, is a separate uh, device, usually my mobile phone, and we set up a WhatsApp call so that we can see each other, my partner and I can see each other and hmm. hear each other. So that that's like okay. Then you can yeah signal and and take yeah. turns yeah. things like that. I mean, uh, quick follow up on pricing. I mean, the, the, how has pricing changed or not changed? Like, you know, for for remote, is there like mm. a standard now that wasn't there before? Or and and the the prices for anything that's now coming back on the on side is, is remains the same? Or how how are the trends there? I think. As far as interpreters' fees are concerned, leaving aside the technology, um, not that much has changed. At the beginning of the pandemic, when we realized that we were going to have to deal with RSI, whether we like to or not, if we want to continue working as interpreters, there was a lot of discussion about adding to the fee because now, of course, you have to maybe get a, a... better internet connection, you have to pay for your infrastructure, you have to get a dedicated laptop, um, all that kind of thing, of course, is is cost for interpreters. I haven't seen that happening personally. Hmm. I would say that the daily or the, the fees are still more or less the same. What has changed, however, is that um, sometimes we have larger teams now. So if it's a, an event that's a bit longer, um, where we used to have or we, where we would have a team of two interpreters in an on-site event, we now have a team of three. So that adds to the cost right. for the client, of course. But basically, it's the same service, isn't it? So, and we add, we, we deliver the same value to our customers. So I don't really see why the prices should be that different. Maybe just one last question from my side, like. Uh... Like in the translation world, there's the whole post editing MT, and you know people are adjusting to these new ways of working. Um, is there any um, kind of general feeling in the interpreting space around these potential like automated competitors that are coming? And we did talk before about kind of Zo- uh, Google adding these kind of live translated captions, mm-hmm. but I think Zoom is now they bought a company, a German company actually, and they're trying to do live speech translation as well. Like, what what are the thoughts around this? I mean, we had this discussion before that it's super hard and I, I don't really see it happening, but what's the general kind of mood among, among interpreters around that? I think that's, I think most interpreters don't see it happening um, in the way that it would replace interpreters. As we said before, um, all this spontaneity and creativity that we bring into our work just cannot... I, cannot be done by machines. However, I do think that, um, especially with captioning and uh, that I can see clients switching from interpreters to just having live captionings of their meetings. So I do, I do think that maybe not next year, but it will take work away from interpreters. That's not the note I want to end on though. Uh, no, no, we, we won't end there. I was going to say we won't end there. I, I mean, I was wondering, actually, just popped into my mind, if you have live captioning, but it's the same language, so captioning of the original language of the speaker accurately, would that also help you as an interpreter if you're seeing visually the words that you need to interpret? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's what we do in the booth when we work with a, with a booth partner. The booth partner writes down numbers, for example. Numbers are really difficult for some reason. Mm. Um, and or names or even the odd word that we don't know. So that's that's what humans do already. And um, I actually read that there are some colleagues now experimenting with live captioning as an aid during an interpreting session. I suppose you'd have to feed it maybe with typical acronyms for that particular client. I, I can see that working. I, I would love to try it out, actually. Mm. Yeah, interesting. I think see see how that whether it helps, whether it doesn't, but uh, I think it potential there maybe. 
Uh, just yeah. to round things off, maybe tell us a little bit about what's next for Petrol Communications uh, in well, going into next year, let's say 2022 and beyond. More of the same, I think. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're certainly doing more um, audiovisual translations now and looking forward to that. I personally really enjoy it because it brings uh, spoken, spoken translation and written translation together. So it's, it's, I think it's, it's something that I find really interesting personally. So we're doing more of that. Um, we have a, a few new members of staff that we're currently training and onboarding. So, um, yeah, looking forward to seeing how that works out and, uh, uh getting them into a routine. Still looking for a translator yeah. for German, if anyone's out there and interested. <laughs> Posted on Lock Jobs, <laughs> shameless plug uh, on our jobs platform. Uh, yeah, audiovisual. Uh, I can tell you that um, um, any language into English dubbing is incredibly sought after and will be so for the next two to three years. People are scrambling to get those those capacities. Uh, it's very very hard. So, um, well, thanks. Well, we end on a on a positive note. Uh, so thanks so much, uh, Anya, for, t for taking the time uh, to speak today. Um, and uh, it was great. Great conversation. I learned a lot. Thanks. Well, thanks, thank Anya. you.